the fourth context is actually the international one. So uh, earlier this afternoon, I think uh, Sir John Daniel um, provoked us a little bit by saying, well, you know, that's been a lot of emphasis on the US context and now let's go international. Uh, here is certainly a second opportunity um, to um, look at the international dimension and OER in the international context. I should also say actually the four uh, case studies we presented here of course are an invitation uh, to um, have deep dives in the four areas we suggested here today um, as you can take from the program the informal and formal learning uh, but then also the uh, domestic and international dimension and we hope tomorrow uh, morning actually for the breakout sessions uh, that these four contexts may be um, a way how you could connect with each other and one thing that would be very helpful if you could tonight essentially sign up on the wiki uh, which session you would like to participate in which um, breakout session you would like to attend that would make it a little bit easier for us to allocate the different rooms to uh, the sessions because we have rooms of various size. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind to pre-select, add your name to the wiki for, for which session um, you would like to be in. And if you want to create a new session, that's fine too with us, of course. Just let us know. Again, Almer is the uh, point person. With that, I think uh, we start with uh, Anka. Well, hello everybody. My name is uh, Anka Mulder. I'm the uh, president of the Open Courseware Consortium. And um, I realize that I'm one of the last speakers. It's the end of the day. I will talk for 10 minutes. I will not talk about uh, rock snot, <laughs> nor uh, pornography, but about Open Courseware. So I hope you will bear with me. So this is what I will be talking uh, about for the next 10 minutes, the open courseware story, although I think many of the things uh, in that part will be uh, familiar to you. Uh, so a little bit about international developments, and then I'll go back to the open courseware consortium. Let's see. Now, I think most of you will know what open courseware is about. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's a form of OER, quite structured. It's structured in the way of a course, and uh, it can consists of uh, almost anything. Here you find some, sub, uh, some um, examples of that. It's mostly courses for higher education, but more and more we include uh, secondary education as well. Started 10 years ago, we just had our 10th anniversary, by MIT when M MIT decided to put all these educational materials online. Now, um, quite soon after MIT started, some other universities decided to join this movement, and together we set up an open courseware consortium, uh, supported by MIT itself, but also by the Hewlett Foundation, and I think without Hewlett we would never have come as far as we are now. And here you find our mission. And I will give you some figures. Yeah, you, uh, here it says we have 260 members, but um, uh, our executive director just counted them and we have 280, so we've been growing. And one of the nice things is that it's a truly uh, global movement. We have members from all over the world. Here you find some of them, uh, members in the United States, Asia, Africa, everywhere. Um, some of our members have set up national consortia. Uh, for example, in Japan, we have Japan Open Courseware in Korea, uh, in China, and Universia we have in uh, Spain. Now, oops, these are our board members, and also the board membership reflects uh, the global character of, um, of our consortium. Um, the consortium, we, there were some questions about sustainability. This is always an issue for the consortium as well. We work on a membership fee basis, so I think you call it membership dues. And uh, so we all pay a small fee, and that pays for about half of the running costs of the organization. So right now, we're, we continue to be dependent on, on funding by organizations, and we're very happy that Hewlett is still funding us. Here you find uh, some information about courses, because the big thing we do is that we publish courses. Now there on the very left, you see the start of the organization, where we had a few hundred courses, and all of those were uh, published by MIT. Now we have uh, 21,000, more than 21,000, and of course they've, they've been published by all our members, so from every single country we have courses published now. 
we do not only publish courses. The consortium helps organizations to start up if they want to uh, set up open courseware for themselves. We have an annual conference. We have a website with a very useful toolkit about uh, legal issues or technical issues or how to convince your management issues. Um, so very useful information on the website. Now, international developments. I've been asked to, to say something about international developments. And, um, I, th I don't think it's useful to discuss every single country or see what's actually happening uh, to open course in these countries, but this is a very important thing we all have to think about, and that's uh, what do governments need? Um, I think government need, governments' needs for higher education can vary per country, but there are some issues which are, are similar in almost every country. Here you find some of them. They're about competition, they're about uh, lifelong learning, or uh, to how to bridge the gap between secondary education and higher education. I think these are pretty universal problems. But I, think, I personally think that the most important thing we have to address is the growing number of students. Uh, you just uh, saw um, Sir John Daniels, he, he uh, said something about this, and I found one of his quotes which says that um, if we want to meet demand in higher education, we will have to build three universities for 20,000 students each per week, and it's pretty clear that we're not going to do that. So governments have uh, found out that, um, um, that they have different expectations from higher education, which is to teach more students for a lower price, higher quality, all kinds of types of students, and uh, to be global as well. And this is really difficult for higher education uh, institutions, and, and we realize that we need open educational resources to help us, and governments realize this too. So John Daniels already uh, mentioned that uh, more and more governments are adopting OER. Um, some of them have specific policies or, or support, uh, financial support measures. Uh, I think UNESCO has played uh, an important role. The European Union, perhaps not relevant for most, of, most people here in the audience, but for me very relevant. Uh, the European Union is also adopting OER more and more. But I also think that um, uh, OER is not mainstream yet. Some people have claimed that OER is mainstream also for governments. I don't think that is the case. We will continue, we need to continue to convince governments to, uh, to help us here. Now, back to OpenCourseWare and the OpenCourseWare Consortium. Vic and Cathy yesterday mentioned something about um, um, their ideas about the open educational uh, resources movement. And in our board and in our organization, uh, we have discussed this too. And I think our conclusions are quite similar. Um, in the first 10 years of our movement, we have focused on providing information, so putting information online. And I think this will continue to be important, but a much more difficult question to address and a question we have to address is what does the learner do with it? What does the learner need? So we discussed things like um, perhaps OpenCourseWare is a building block, something really useful, but you have to do something with it. Um, I don't know if you have ever tried to study something online, do an online course. Philip already mentioned that that be, can, can be quite tedious and hard. I found it really, really hard to, uh, to complete a course online because you need so much self-discipline and so much motivation to do that on your own. So um, I think what we should do here uh, as open educational resources uh, people is make it more attractive and uh, focus on what um, learners actually want to do with our information. So paths of instruction, build communities, or also find ways to, uh, um, to connect with employers, see that open courseware um, uh, courses can help people find a job. So focus from, uh, uh, on demand rather than supply, on learning rather than information, addressing government's needs, and taking new developments into account. Um, I, ha I just have, as a last thing, I have some examples uh, which I find particularly interesting because they are about services around OpenCourseWare. And this is one of them. So this is, I think, op using OpenCourseWare as a building block. This is Open Study. Open Study is a tiny little organization here in the US, and what it does is ju it just uses uh, open courseware. It, it asks you, can I use your materials? And, um, and then it just invites lots and lots of students or self-learners to register. And it's the sheer numbers that count. So if you have thousands of learners in the group of maths or accounting, 
and you're studying this online, you're studying it together with other students. You can post your ideas or you can post your questions and because there are so many of you, you will get an answer within minutes. I think a very interesting development. Here's another one uh, many of you may know, MITx, but also FGV Online in Brazil. Uh, what they're doing is um, uh, looking into certificates of attendance after you've completed an open courseware course. Of course, an example from my own university, Delft University of Technology. Um, we have uh, developed a water management program for our own students, and we put that online. And we um, had a chat with the University of Bandung in Indonesia, and they're now using this course 100%, so nothing new about it, uh, very efficient. Uh, and the only thing they've added to the course is uh, they've translated some of the videos and they added local case studies, because you can imagine that some water issues are different in Indo Indonesia than they are in the Netherlands. What we also do is um, um, continue to, um, to express how important open education is. Uh, Cathy yesterday mentioned the Open Education Week. Um, that was an initiative of the Open Courseware Consortium, and we've been very happy with the effect of it. Um, we had media coverage from uh, the Times Higher in the UK, but also uh, uh, the New York Times, International Herald Tribune, because we believe it's, it's very important to tell the world about, uh, world about um, open education. Finally, addressing government's needs. Uh, this is the European Union. One of the challenges of the European Union is to, um, to make, it e make students more mobile between countries, to, so to increase mobility. And what the consortium is doing is it's running a project doing exactly that and using open educational resources. Now, um, that was an overview of OpenCourseWare and the uh, OpenCourseWare consortium. Uh, if you want to hear more, then join us uh, and UNESCO next week in the other Cambridge on the other side of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we have time for questions or votes. I, I have one to start off, mm -hmm. um, especially considering the European context and you have one bullet point that said uh, different or kind of legal regimes. How, how important would you say is it for an open educational resource platform um, to figure out how to reconcile the different legal regimes. Obviously a, a problem that is almost appears all the time when doing something across Europe. It, has that been a problem in this context? Or would you say, for instance, uh, countries like the US have, have an advantage here, comparatively speaking? I mean, just to give you an example, um, one could wonder looking at cloud computing and cloud computing companies, mm -hmm. it's heavily dominated by US companies, obviously, for a number of reasons, but one argument is that European cloud providers uh, have a disadvantage because they have to struggle with many, many different jurisdictions with different rules, for instance, about privacy, of course, copyright and so forth, despite mm -hmm. some high level harmonization at the EU level. Does the same dynamics play out in this context or isn't it that much of a problem? Well, um, I think Creative Commons can say more about this particular issue, to be honest. And um, one, ad uh, one advantage of the European Union is that we have European law on many things. And if I look at, uh, if I compare uh, Europe to uh, the United States, I sometimes have the feeling that, uh, that the differences between states here um, may be bigger than they are even in the European Union. But, so. Legal issues are important, but I think, you know, uh, look at our the toolkits and find solutions. Uh, we have creative commons. I think uh, um, we shouldn't spend too much time on, on uh, we shouldn't be bogged down on that issue, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs>